collega di Boston e direttore del programma Harvard per i, i rifugiati con trauma. I'd like to thank the program organizers and a special thank, thank you to Ricardo Palasante, who I've known for almost 30 years. Excuse me. Oh. Ah, okay. I'd like to thank the program organizers. A special thank you to Ricardo Calasante, Dr. Calasante. We did, if you remember, the first medicine and migration conference in 1992. Can you imagine? Way back. No. And um, we had a vision back then of putting mental health on the international policy agenda for refugees. Because in 1995, I was thrown out of the High Commissioner's office in Geneva because she said refugees do not have mental health problems. He said, it was the former Prime Minister of Denmark who threw me out of his office. He says, refugees don't have mental health problems. They're like a rubber band. You pull them. They stretch. They're suffering. As soon as they go home, they bounce back to normal. Have you heard this? Now, we've also been involved in Alakala. We have a special program for general medical doctors in Norcia uh, who are suffering through the earthquake. And that's a whole other story, the problems of disaster in Italy and the whole problem of mental health in Italy for disaster victims. You know. But So I've been involved in this country with Ricardo's and others since 1980. And so I decided, I said, will I give this talk today in English or in the Amalfi dialect of my mother? You want the Amalfi dialect? Anyone here speak the Amalfi? Okay, so anyway, I'm gonna give it, I'm gonna give it in English. So let's go here. What I'm gonna try to do is give you something new, a different way of thinking about mental health and refugees, displaced people, people who've been through extreme violence. Uh, because the models we have today come out of World War II and are out of date. They're out of date, let's be honest. They don't work. The tents that refugees in today are the tents of World War II. And we don't, we're going to show you, we don't need these tents. We can do a better job without tents. So here's the first thing we're going to change. This is the WHO definition of health. 1948, pretty anemic, pretty weak. Here's the feminist definition. Here's the feminist definition of health from Gujarat, India that we use. Health is a personal social state of balance and well-being in which people feel strong, active, wise, worthwhile, where the diverse capacities and rhythms are valued, where they may decide and choose and express themselves a little bit freely. A woman who has a normal lab test and physical exam, who's a victim of domestic violence, is not healthy. A refugee who has normal physical exam, normal lab test, who's experienced mass violence and torture, is not healthy. This is a different definition of WHO. We need to modify it based on a feminist definition. An Irish poet said, there are only two stories. Who am I? And I'm leaving home and I'm coming home. Of course, in the Catholic Church, we talk about the prodigal son, right? I mean, we know the story of the prodigal son. Who am I? I'm leaving home, I'm coming home. Do you know there's absolutely no research on the concept of home for the refugee? What is the meaning of home? What is the meaning of an Italian-American whose mother is from Amalfi, father from Chile? It, it's still in me, but I was born and raised in the United States. What is the meaning of home? Don't you think this is an important thing to know, psychologically, medically, socially, the meaning of home? And here, because of our work in Lebanon, which I'm gonna show you, the Phoenicians who brought the alphabet to the Greeks and Romans Right? 
This is the letter Beth, home. The letter Beth, the letter B is home. And in Arabic, there it is, Beth. Any Arabic Islamic people here? This is a very important, meaningful term to the Arabic speaking people, the meaning of home. And then of course, since we're here at the Old Vatican, we have to bring in Latin. Habitari. The word habitat is derived from the Latin habitari, and in the ancient world meant the total environment in which a person or an organism dwelt. And there was a belief that a reciprocal relationship exists between the physical and natural environment and those living organisms who live and prosper within these environments. The frog lives in the pond. The pond lives in the frog. A healthy pond is a healthy frog. A healthy frog, this is completely a disaster when it comes to refugee environments. There's rape going on every day in most refugee camps. And we have not been able to change this. And everyone in this room knows this. And, and the High Commissioner knows this. So let's go quickly through mental health and we we'll get into the new model here. Mental health problems are high. Well, we don't know much about them, but we know about PTSD and depression. It, it runs somewhere here, you know, 66 in the acute phase, 66, 33 percent. And if you look at the research, recent study in Syria, in Turkey of Syrian refugees, uh, a very important study, 2015, you see here again, 33.5%. This, this is consistent. And then if you look here at the next slide, look at the, look at the trauma that people have been through. Experience and witness the death of a close friend or a family member, 66%. The human rights violations that Dr. Guerrero talked about, here they are. Witness torture and beating, 31%. Unbelievable, right? You know, so when you go through this, this is, this is a typical study we see over and over and over again. And we were one of the first ones to document this in 19 in the thai Cambodian border. Now I'm going to run through quickly the data because I don't have a lot of time because I reviewed the literature for you on the mental health impact of displacement. And here, forced displacement, if you look at this review, Oops, sorry, go back here. Sorry about that. If you go here, in the Marina study, 950 studies, it shows the high rate of post-traumatic stress disorder and depression. Okay, everyone knows that in this room, right? And here, uh, there was an example, another one, because I presented this on webinar recently, 310 refugees living in, in a refugee camp, 43% were depressed. Now, I mean depressed means diagnosable psychiatric disorder. It doesn't mean just being sad. It's a diagnosable, diagnosable psychiatric disorder. Now, if you go to the next slide, forced displacement, you see the systematic review of unpublished studies here, study of Palestinian refugees, 43% had moderate to severe depressive symptoms. So the impact is high in terms of PTSD and depression. In the, in the Palestinians, 42% live in poverty, 20% had poor health, and participants who had better perceived health and rather return were less likely to be depressed. Because this is very important, I'm gonna get into this in a minute. So if you look at the next slide, Again, a uh, systematic review shows that psychological stress was exacerbated by environmental factors, poor housing, poor finances, no employment, psychosocial outcomes, loss of role, social support and activity, work of social support, and psychosocial approaches had impact, positive impact. Okay, if you go to the next slide, uh, this is a very important slide in Sweden. 
with the refugees in Sweden, they had a rate of PTSD of 30% and in Turkey, 55%. So you see all the same numbers. That's high. You know what the rate of PTSD is in Italy? 1 to 3%. Depression, 7%. This is high. When you're 20, 30, 40, 60, it's a huge impact. Refugees, of course, who, who, who experience atrocities, you know, are a life threatener, had family, friends die, had the highest levels. So especially disappearance and the loss of a child is very hard for someone to recover from. Disappearance and the loss of a child is terrible, and a lot of these people have had this experience. Now you're going to see the suicide here. Look at the suicide right here. In these Iraqi displaced people, nine deaths per thousand. Iraqi, 149 per thousand. The uh, mortality, the morbidity mortality rate, four to 0 0.25. This is huge possibility of suicidal ideation. And you know in Mortra, we're having suicides? Did you know that? From the disaster? It's coming. We predicted this, and, and we're having a hard time getting the bureaucracy to deal with this in, in Mortra. Now, if you go to the next slide here, what about repatriation, people going home? Practically no research like say Ecuadorian send the Venezuelans home. Practically no research. The only studies that have been done in Georgia, for instance, shows uh, high rates, high rates of PTSD for repatriated refugees. And then in the next slide you'll see um, here that uh, in that that the the uh, somatic the, the somatic complaints were high, you know. So I think that um, there you go. So you can see this is one of the few studies on repatriation. Nothing on repatriation. Yet that's the goal of the refugee policy: send people home, right? When the Civil War is gone, the conflict is gone, have people around. But look at, we have one or two studies. That's it. And the rates of people going home is high for PTSD. Now, there was a study in Vietnam on repatriation. And immigrants did worse than returnees. This is interesting. Immigrants in uh, Vietnam had higher prevalence of mental health problems than returnees or people who didn't leave the country. This is a very fascinating finding, you know, when you think about it. Again, very little research. Now I'm sort of coming to I got 10 minutes on that. I want to talk to you about the new model. So you are, I am sure, are aware of Maslow's hierarchy. This is the Bible of humanitarian relief. This is the Bible of humanitarian relief. Every NGO, Italy, all over the world, working with refugees, High Commissioner, IOM, they all use Maslow's. This, this was written in 1947. Now, if you look at the hierarchy here, he had a model here, basic needs, physiological, you know, this is food, water, shelter. Sounds familiar, right? Security. Safety, food, water, shelter, safety, love and belonging, esteem, and self actualization. What you're going to see now is that we got a lot of good work here done on this, absolutely nothing on this. And Hart Muzzle had a theory that you go from basic needs through safety, through love, and that it's hierarchical, that you have to build. Now, of course, the research has shown this is completely up there. This is not a nonlinear. This is a nonlinear model because his goal was self-actualization. In other words, he believed a man or woman should be 
what a man or woman can be. That was his famous saying. Right? That we're all searching, this is Victor Frankl, right? Primo Levi, Victor Frankl. You know, we're all searching for meaning, right? And so every human being is searching for meaning. So they, they're on this heartbeat. Now, if you look at the data, housing, poverty, all you know, outside of trauma. Trauma, of course, is highly associated with PTSD and depression. More trauma, more PTSD, more depression. But if you look at the secondary factors, you know, so we have here, we have here housing, poor housing, poverty, ongoing violence. Okay, next slide. Discrimination, assault. This is big in the United States now. Discrimination, uh, ostracism, bullying. This is big in Lebanon. People bully, ostracize, and attack the Syrian refugees in the community. Health status, unemployment. Okay. Loss of social role, especially for men. Refugee men lose their social role. Paradoxically, refugee women go up, men go down in traditional societies. Inactivity, right of return, giving, you know, giving and giving up. This is what we found in the Bosnian refugees. Old people give up and die, but not from illness. This is a well-known concept called giving and giving up. Hey, I just give up. I lost everything. Now I'm going home. I have nothing. Bye. I'm out of here. And th this is what we're seeing also in disaster relief. Giving and giving up is a very important psychological phenomenon. No? When you've lost everything, you've lost your home, your family, you know, you've seen your husband beheaded. This is what we see in Lebanon. You no. Know, because we have a big project in Lebanon. Now, this is nothing. No research on Maslow. Post-traumatic growth. Is it possible in a crisis to grow? How many people here think it's possible in a crisis, a tragedy to grow? Anybody agree with that? Yeah, I mean, you've got people, no, this is the uh, great story of Primo Levi, you know? He said, I knew Primo Levi, I met him. He said to me, he goes, uh, the lesson of the Holocaust is the lesson of how to live everyday life. It's not just about the Holocaust. It's a how do you live everyday life? And that's a great lesson, Victor Frankl and all. Humiliation is the main goal of perpetrators. We violate other people through humiliating acts like raping a woman in a village destroys the whole village to create the state of humiliation. This is in my book. I was one of the first. And then dignity. This is Italian. Dignitas, right? Do you know there's not a single paper written on how to restore traumatized people to human dignity? It's amazing, isn't it? All the stuff that's happened since World War II, we don't have a single paper on how to restore human beings to human dignity, especially uh, children, women and children. And then finally, the self-actualization thing here, the self-actualization thing, here, oops, let me get back there. We don't know much about how to build on people's strengths so out of a tragedy and a crisis, they become stronger. Right? This should be a goal. This should be one of our themes, no? Especially for Catholic people, right? It should be one of our themes. Dignity, respect, esteem, building one's worthiness, restoring one's wellness in the world, right? This should be a goal, no? The word wellness is never even used in a refugee camp. We're using it because I want to show you briefly. I've got a couple of minutes under the head. So here's the H5 model, my H5 model, which is catching on. This is at a clinical level. This is not Maslow's model. You have the trauma story here. 
humiliation, self-healing, health emotion, habitat, and human rights. So we're saying, let's take a look at the Maslow model in a different way. If anybody's interested in this, I can send, send this chapter to them on the H5 model. And then here, this is the new model we created in Lebanon for Syrian, Syrian refugee and refugee children. And here in this model, you're going to see something very interesting. So in this model of the bringing Maslow, Maslow was in the clinical model. Bringing the clinical model with the Maslow's self-actualization model, you come up with this new model. There it is. So you have here built environment. This is a good built environment. I'll tell you about this in a minute. Basic needs, trauma story, self-healing, self-promotion, empathic part. You need the glue. Maslow had no glue in this model. We think empathy is the glue. And of course, you guys have discovered the mirror neurons, right? They were discovered here, you know, in Italy, and uh, we're big on mirror neurons and empathy. Humiliation, Con conversation, this is very Italian, right? Mm -hmm. Having a conversation, right? Reflection through meditation and prayer, the sacraments. And then finally, small 10% of people will need specialized therapies like CBT, medication, or EMDR, only 10%. So this is the new model we came up with in Lebanon. And here, I'm ready to end here soon. So here, here it is. So here's home, violence, restoration during displacement. This is Lebanon. This is Norcha. This is what's going on in Norcha. Mm -hmm. And then here's the transfer phase where you go back home again. This could be Ecuador sending the people back to Venezuela. Okay, you see this model here? Now, if you look at this, the built environment. So what we did in Lebanon, the Rabia Shibli and his group at American University, they said, hey, let's get the kids to build their own schools. And let's do it cheaper than tents. Can you imagine building a beautiful school cheaper than a UN tent where you fry in the summer and you freeze in the winter and, and 20 people live in the same little tent? This got to go. This model has to go. So when you look at this here, the, the built environment has space, relationship forces, outcomes. And then here with the kids who built this, I'm going to show this in a minute, uh, this will we'll skip. And then here, if you go here, this is the 10th city of refugees in Becca Valley, Lebanon, with ISIS was right over the border when we were there. Dash, I don't know what you call it. ISIS or Dash, I don't know what you're generally you from. No, ISIS, they're terrible. Yeah. And the kids didn't want to go to school. And they were singing ISIS, ISIS, ISIS every day. These are elementary school kids because they have no hope. So Rabia came. How many people would like to spend 15, 20 years living in these tents? Raise your hand. That's what they got here going on. Can you imagine? This is stuff going back to the 50s. OK, so Rabia came along and said, hey, this is cheaper than a tent. Let's get recyclable material and have the kids build their own school. What did they get out of here? Elementary school kids building their own school. I tried to do this in Lakala. It was impossible because of the bureaucracy, you know, time bureaucracy. Tried to get teenagers to rebuild their houses in Lakala. <laughs> their family house. So here, in Lebanon, we can do it. Look at that school. Wow, can you imagine this? Compare to this. This is what the kids, the elementary school kids built this school for themselves. You know, they come early, they leave late, and their attendance is very high. We did a study comparing 10 schools versus these kids. The, the results were dramatic between the 10th school and these built schools by the kids. 
Everything was improved, and the parents loved it. It was a beautiful environment. And there's an area of view of the school the kids built. So this goes back to this idea of the built environment. Now, because we're here in a Catholic environment, I don't know much about St. Thomas Aquinas. We have any St. Thomas Aquinas scholars here? But Aristotle's natural law would be very happy with this model, right? What is it that's natural that every human being needs? Every human being needs, now this is my Italian side coming out, to live in a beautiful environment. And it doesn't cost any money to live in a beautiful environment. And so we have a saying in our group, there's no healing without beauty. No healing without beauty. And no healing without justice. That's again Aristotle again. Here's my book where we talk about self-healing humiliation. So that, that's so I, I want to leave you with this message that let's move into the 21st century. Why are we still promoting policies and programs that don't work, that are not restoring people to human dignity, to wellness, cheaper than what we're spending right now? And let's do away with all the rape that's going on in these refugee camps. It's not every refugee camp you go to all over the world is an epidemic of rape. You know? So I would want to leave you with that note, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Professor Monica, for your presentation, for your presence here. And any question? Any question? Uh, I reflect. Uh, you say habitat. Yeah? Uh, habitat, the etymology of uh, habitat uh, is uh, uh, the Latin uh, word uh, abeo. Abeo is uh, to have, avere. In Italia noi diciamo avere, in Italia noi sei avere. Abitare un luogo, abitare my house, uh, is not the same to say to live. Yeah, yeah. Abitare Roma, io abito a Roma, is not even I live in Rome. Uh, in your opinion, I want to know, is it possible? Uh, can migrants ever abitare the new place, the, the new city? Or the migrants only can live in the new city? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a, a concept uh, uh, in humanitarian relief for refugees um, where, and I think the minister can talk to this, you know, uh, he doesn't do it in this country, thank you for that fantastic, wonderful presentation, you know, that, um, that um, you try to make the refugee situation as bad as possible, but you don't kill them. This is the Trump model. This is the Trump. But this goes back to the Thai-Cambodian border. You know, what they call this humane deterrence. You make it so bad that they don't want to come. And then the people here, you create a tremendous amount of human misery. This is a policy of the UN that goes back to the 1990. I, mean, I worked in the Thai-Cambodian border for 10 years. That was my first big experience. And half a million people living, can you imagine this as Italians, living in a city called Site 2.
Can you imagine an Italian saying, where do you live? Oh, I live in number three, city number three. That's human degradation at its worst. And men and women in the city call sight too. But that was the Thai philosophy, the UN philosophy, Umbro, try to keep it, because politically, the UN has a problem. They can't have the refugee have a better situation than the local people. You understand what I'm saying? Right? There is, in your country, you're able to do it, give them free health care. It's unbelievable. I mean, I've complimented your country. It's fantastic, you know. But in our country, uh, that's why Trump on the border started separating families from children to torture them and to put fear in them and to make them say, oh, I can't go to America. You know? So to answer your question, the, and I, I think the Pope talked about this, that we're, when are we going to get to the point that a displaced person who's seen their father beheaded, who's a kid, probably should be able to come to Italy, the United States, and find a good life, you know? I'm not a philosopher, so I, I'm not a political scientist. But we're not at that point, right? Definitely not at that point, you know? So to answer your question is, what the, what the, uh, the Lebanese have done, the Lebanese architects have done, like for instance, they went into the ghetto of Palestine camps, 28 years, terrible ghetto, you know? And they took every house in this ghetto and they plant, planted plants in old toilet bowls, sinks, tomato cans. By the time they were through, I don't have a slide, the place was a garden of Eden. It didn't cost any money. So how do you go from a slum to a garden of Eden on no money? It takes imagination. And also it takes, uh, when people are humiliated, I'm gonna end this, when people are humiliated, we, see we don't have a theory for extreme violence. When people are humiliated either by cancer, by health problems, by extreme violence, by displacement, we don't have a psychological theory of social reclaiming human dignity in the state of humiliation. Have you heard the UN talk about humiliation? I never had once. Yet every refugee that I've known talks about humiliation, deep humiliation. And that's the goal of the perpetrator. So I think we need a new psychology. I think we can do it here in Italy because Italy is one of my mother's country, so it's uh, my father too. So I think uh, the Italians understand this. The Italians understand this. Yeah. So I don't know if I answered your question. We, wellness. We need to focus not on pathologizing people, but on looking on restoring people to human dignity and wellness. Is that, what do you think? It makes sense, right? So I hope that. And it doesn't cost more money. I mean, this is, I'm American, I have to say this, you know. We have to talk about money all the time. The, the school and the tent, it's more expensive to have those tents than that school. Can you imagine it? Is there anything okay. else? Yes. I could ask you, when did you get the funds to build the, the schools where you go to on Lebanon? It came, from, uh, it came from uh, local, uh, local uh, Lebanese donors. Uh -huh. Yeah. Came from outside Lebanon? No, inside Lebanon. Oh, okay. Yeah, it came from local Lebanese donors inside Lebanon. Yeah. We just donated a lot of money from the Italian American Foundation Bio to Norcia to rebuild the school, help rebuild the school using the same model with the kids uh, trying to work on the school, build a garden, a beautiful place, you know, because the kids are really suffering in North you know. So this model is, uh, if we can get any new rocks. Because I, I think uh, I was thinking about this would be just a drop in a, so a huge sea, as you say, you see, I mean, this is cool and the, the, the structures you built there could be only a drop, as you say in Italian. It's it's a, drop, a, yeah. a translation, but from drop Italian directly, of course. So, um, it's a very good example, but uh, I think it's only one. Yeah, but we're now, uh, we, we submitted a grant to UNESCO through the American University, and they, they want to fund it to scale it up. 
the World Bank as well, you know. So I, I no, there are people who are interested in what they call scaling up, you know. In my mind, every refugee camp should be built by the people using recyclable material that's culturally based because you gotta put art there from the culture, you know, sewing and tapestries and things like this. And you would save a lot of money and also create a healing environment, you know. Could be done. Yeah, sure. Why not? Why couldn't the UN decide to put their money into this instead of pence? Don't you think that Professor Wilkin, if you say something not being done, because it costs money and nobody's making a kick. Well, this, this I don't know about that, but clearly in Wakala, we all know the story of Wakala. Yeah. That was a total disaster with a lot of corruption. In fact, when I was in Wakala, I met the mafia myself, and they came up to me and I said, what are you guys doing? Because we're there to help. They said, where are the Camorra? I said, yeah, Camorra, really? Yeah, we're building these buildings. They, they, they had no shame. I'm serious. I, I was in a state of shock because the buildings they were built were terrible, disgusting. No garden, no porch, nothing. You know. So I, th I think the political... And same thing Iraq. Iraq has given money to all the Right. Yes. They yeah. just had a they yeah. But what do you think in terms of this conference? You know, you want new ideas, right? I mean, I, I think we got to think about um, how to hold uh, people with the first strings responsible. So maybe the Catholic Church can do this, you know. Yeah. And also in um, Lebanon, they have uh, 17 religions, you know, and so there's a very strong uh, relationship to, they have uh, Marianites. They have Druze, you know, it's, it's a fast, fascinating country you know, with all the religions there. And the religious groups have been pretty good in um, Lebanon. Because yeah. a third of the country is refugee. You know. But what do you think about how would you solve this corruption problem? Well, I think in a way it has been solved by, as you said, by getting money to different ways, to NGOs, yeah. to uh, funds, special funds, where it's really difficult to get the corruption. But as far as the big money, that's the big problem. The big money, yeah. yeah. And the big money is wrong as the politics is not as far as the development is Yeah. Well, thank you, Fred. What are, what's your idea on the big money? Uh, I think it's really a problem. No, I was thinking about that now, when you, just now, I was thinking about the reconstruction of that. Now. You know, they're trying to, they're trying, just, they're not planning it anymore. No, but they, they will plan. It's, uh, they're doing, I mean, their minds, uh, leaders around, around the world and so on, to try to reconstruct the, the Christian environment. I mean, the, 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 the association, the Christian association, are thinking about to, to reconstruct it. Uh, right. Yeah, just to, to make Christians go back home. Right? And I think this is a very, will be a very, very big business. And then we have to take the, our, our attention on the problem because it could be a really global problem, I mean, you know. Think about the corruption over there. What yeah, could this, be the future? Uh, what could uh, be the future there? Yeah, because this is a Catholic meeting, right? I mean, this is a Christian meeting. That there's a beautiful movie. Um, I know the Chaldeans, you know, the Chaldeans yeah, speak yeah. the language of Jesus yeah. Christ, you know, and they're kind of Catholics in a way, you know, uh, original Catholics, you know, because they were there with Jesus Christ, right? So they, uh, they went into a destroyed village, you know, and uh, there's a beautiful movie where what is a home, going home, a little boy went into his home, was completely destroyed by ISIS, the whole town was destroyed by ISIS, you know. And he found a marble, his marbles from when he was a kid, you know. And this was a treasure to him, these marbles. And then outside in the village, at the top of the hill, the Chaldeans put a giant crucifix. And they mobilize, they're mobilizing their uh, building, built environment, rebuilding that town around this crucifixion. And they, uh, we 
because the crucifixion also for them is rebirth, right? I'm not a theologian, but I, I mean, I think there's something there about uh, this beautiful, this movie you should see it. It's a gorgeous movie where they had a huge crucifixion in a completely destroyed town and the people excited to be there to rebuild their town. Thank, Thank you, you Professor. Monica sarà poi presente anche il 6 eh, marzo per un seminario ancora più dettagliato insomma, quanto riguarda la salute mentale e le migrazioni eh, presso il Policlinico Genetico la mattina del 6 marzo quindi Monica sarà approfittata della sua presenza benvenuto Prima di dare la parola al professor Iannini voglio fare una breve considerazione. Il, eh, la psichiatria eh, ottocentesca considerava il migrante un arenato mentale in quanto diverso e strano per eccellenza. Ora, ancora oggi la combinazione migrante e paziente eh, psichiatrico eh, suscita un duplice eh, pregiudizio, sentimenti di paura, apprensione e rifiuto. Ma io penso che noi psichiatri, operatori della salute mentale in Italia, eh, siamo stati già vaccinati dalla riforma psichiatrica, dalla chiusura dei manicomi e siamo qui impegnati nella nostra storia a dar voce eh, alle, eh, alle differenze e quindi a restituire i diritti di cittadinanza e ugualmente nei nostri servizi del Dipartimento di Salute Mentale dell'ASL eh, Roma 2 e cerchiamo di affrontare la patologia psichiatrica le persone con i disturbi mentali e eh, i migranti che hanno eh, disturbi mentali eh, con eh, criteri di comprensione eh, combattendo l'esclusione e i pregiudizi.